Oh my goodness, I'm a couple of seconds, I'm a couple of minutes late. Let's see if all this is set up and ready to go. Oh no, I'm running late. <laughs> all right. Uh, welcome, welcome. Welcome back yet again. Uh, I'm just checking to make sure everything's running smoothly. I am a couple of minutes late today. I was reading an article and just got kind of lost in it. <laughs> um, so yeah, here we are. Uh, this is this is day four of the CCNA adventure, um, where I am hoping to obtain my CCNA certificate by the end of March. Um, so I do have three other certificates and a bachelor's degree. Um, the bachelor's degree is not IT related though. Um, I only have a little bit of experience in the actual IG, IT job market. Um, that's the hope of the CCNA uh, Cisco certificate is that it will launch me into the next bracket of IT jobs. Um, so the one IT job I had was not so much, um, there wasn't a lot, I shouldn't say there wasn't a lot of technical troubleshooting involved because there actually was, but it was all based on this company specific device and I was outward facing. So I was dealing directly with customers um, and I'm hoping to get a job where uh, one, it's it's higher level, so the job I had only required a uh, high school degree, and um, it didn't require any of the certificates I had. So uh, while it was good um, exposure to ticket systems and different um, programs and applications that you're going to use in the IT field, uh, it wasn't a really good use of my background in education. So I'm really hoping that this certificate um, propels me into that next group where you're working with the networking, um, where you're working intern. I would love an internal job. So instead of facing outward towards customers, you're facing uh, inward towards uh, your coworkers and peers. Because um, it's just, it's amazing um, the change that that brings in people's attitudes when they have a problem. <laughs> That's as far as I'll go with that. Um, so yeah, again, this is day four. Um, and I wanna start today uh, just by talking a little bit about motivation <laughs> uh, mindset. So uh, a lot of times, if anyone actually goes through all these and or any of these and listens to me uh, for any amount of time, they'll know that I use the word perspective a lot. I'll also use the word mindset a lot. Maybe that's two words. Um, because I think it's so important, especially when you're challenging yourself. And there's no doubt about it, going after these certificates is a challenge, right? It's not something that you would typically wanna do. Um, and let me just talk about myself, for instance. So we've been in a pandemic for uh, a year, you know, for a year, people have been uh, out of work or staying at home in some capacity and have had the ability to to um, use newfound uh, free time, whether or not they want that free time. Uh, they can use it, uh, I could use it how I pleased, right, in, in some aspect. And almost this entire time, I felt like this would be perfect for me to achieve some more certificates. Um, this would be a great opportunity for me <laughs> to do a little bit more to use this time um to achieve something else and i fell victim um to my greatest weakness uh which is just saying tomorrow right like so often i can i could say man that'd be great to do but you know just not feeling it right now or or uh for whatever reason you know and, and I'll come up with this excuse where I'll say, you know what, tomorrow sounds like the perfect day to start that. I'm gonna start that certificate um, tomorrow. And in that moment, I, I feel like I really mean it. Like I really mean like, I'm excited about it. I'm like, man, tomorrow I'm really gonna, I'm gonna take it on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna feel better than I felt today. 
and I'm gonna feel so motivated, right? I'm gonna feel, I'm gonna wake up motivated. I'm gonna wake up ready to take this on. And I think that's something that a lot of people fall victim to, thinking that motivation is gonna be there prior to you starting a difficult task. Um, and I don't think that's, that's accurate. I think people develop the ability, develop the structure so that they uh, they can put themselves into a difficult task and they can work on it. But I don't think that motivation comes until you're actually doing the task. Uh, and it often comes after you, or, or certainly the reinforcement of that motivation comes when you hit like a eureka moment, when you achieve something that you otherwise wouldn't have achieved, like that difficult problem that you've been struggling to comprehend all of a sudden, it's not all of a sudden, right? There's a lot of work that goes into it. You have to you have to be there, you have to do it. But when it clicks, when that change happens from something you struggle with to something that you inherently now understand, that's where you get the motivation. That's where you're like, oh yeah, like I get it now. I understand this. I can I can explain it to other people. I can feel confident in my knowledge. That's in my view, that's where motivation comes from. And so it's not something that comes before the task. It's not something you can ex rely on or expect um, to get you through these difficult um, journeys that you take, right? Like, it's, it's day four of this, and uh, I, you know, I struggle with, with tomorrow all the time. Uh, luckily, with these with these wrap-ups at the end of the day, I know I can't put it off to tomorrow, but I still have smaller fights, right? Like, um, how many times can I hit snooze in the morning, right? Like, these these boot camps that I do, I intentionally wake up at 4 in the morning. I, I wake up really early um, to, like, pounce on the day. It, it reminds me of my boot camp days. Like, there's just something about um, waking up really early working really hard throughout the day, not only mentally, but physically, and then just getting like a compact amount of sleep and just doing it all over again. There's something about that that kind of trains your brain uh, not to think about the tomorrows, <laughs> but it's hard. It's still really hard. I still have these fights throughout the day. Um, and that's why I talk about mindset. Like I have to remind myself um, that if I don't start, that if I don't even begin the task, there's no way I'm going to complete it. That I could end up wasting this entire uh, time in pandemic and not accomplish anything. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I think, like a lot of people, like if I had access to a time machine, what would I, what would I go back and fix? And a lot of the things I think about that I go back and fix is something that I could have done or I can still do anyways. It's just that I don't want to, right? Like it's that upfront cost, it's that steep learning curve, it's the initial um, investment into the task that's difficult that makes me not wanna do it. That or, you know, sometimes it's financial, but ultimately um, it's often the fact that starting's hard, right? Like it's not fun typically, unless it's something you want to do, but that's a whole different thing. Like. You, <laughs> right you don't have to be motivated to do things you want to do right they uh they inherently pay themselves off because it's something you really enjoy um so yeah i just wanted to talk a little bit about motivation and why it's important that every day even if all you do is start just start because that's where you build like even if all you do is wake up and watch the first minute of your of the course that you're supposed to watch that day realize that that that's a minute further in than you would have got if you would have played the tomorrow game you know and that as silly as it sounds those little victories add up they build momentum and if if you stick with them if you don't let yourself become pessimistic or allow that voice in your head to to whittle away and say, oh, but tomorrow, but to just five minutes here, 10 minutes here. Like if you can keep that, if you can continue to allow yourself to start in the morning and start these programs when you're supposed to, following through will become easier and easier because 
before you know it, you'll be like, well, I'm already here. I've already played this part. You know, I might as well get all the way through it, or I can do five more minutes and then 10 more minutes. And it's these, it's these small victories that are gonna add up and get you to a place where you've accomplished what you needed to accomplish. And I just, I talk about this because I think so many people feel like you're either born a type A or a type B. And I think I, there, there are type A and type B people, but I think, again, it's a learned behavior. And it's something that becomes so ingrained in your personality that it can become an aspe a large aspect of who you are to the point where people describe you as, oh, that's a type A person or a type B person. But again, that you weren't born that way. Like you may be born in a way that you're more inquisitive or maybe you're like, you're able to make uh, those eureka moments uh, in a quicker way so you can kind of like tie it to like if I do something I automatically benefit like there's cost benefit analysis is going to be different for people how much they have to put into a task to receive a benefit um, but ultimately it's going to be just show up just start just show up just start just like I know I have to wake up at four o'clock in tomorrow morning I know I have to start my video that's what I'm going to do there is no I'll do that tomorrow like I have to do that much and if I do that much then it becomes easier to do the rest there's that aspect of I'm already here I'm already doing this what's the point in stopping like it just becomes easier and easier to continue those like you get momentum right like momentum is such a big thing in life so motivation like collect your momentum in life <laughs> like move forward just start right and like you see that you'll see a lot of of people in these fields talk about this stuff it's not people in life will talk about this stuff but like you can look at um this is one of the instructors that i'm using and this, stu <laughs> this stuff is so cheesy right like these stupid little motivational posts that don't i mean they're just like little nothings but this is a big part of his website. He's got a whole motivation part. And it's because it's so easy when you're doing these tasks to talk yourself out of it, to not be motivated, to be the tomorrow person. So as, as silly as this is, if you're, the human brain is so amazing. If you're receptive to it, like when you smile, you talk in a more positive way, like it just, it's ingrained in your ability. If, you, if you're more accepting to, to this momentum to this motivation then it really will help you like don't don't get too crazy with it don't be like uh <laughs> What's, oh i'm spacing that guy that did the green screen thing just do it just do it like don't <laughs> but i mean that also speaks to how amazingly um receptive the brain is right like People can really get on a motivation spree to the point where they just like don't understand why you wouldn't just do it. So just just start the day. Just start the day and do what you need to do. Um, yeah, so that was kind of my little motivation spiel, uh, the issues that I ran across and, and how I try to keep my mindset positive. And I know that as long as I start on the process that I'm accomplishing something that I'm getting somewhere that I'm further along than I would have been if I just said tomorrow right and that's something you know I'm doing better than I typically would be doing like that's that's movement that's that's a step in the right direction so um, these are not easy subjects you know there, it's it's technical material. It's dense uh, for a lot of these concepts. If you're new to them, there's going to be a real steep learning curve associated with it. Um, oftentimes, not only is the course material, but also the instruction is is dry because there's just not a lot. To, <laughs> there's not a lot to work with when you're talking about uh, binary to dotted decimal. Uh, how many octets make up an IP address? You know, there's not there's not. A lot of opportunity to inject humor or um, lightness it is just kind of a trudge through all this uh, technical 
understanding before you can even get to the aspects of how these networks communicate. Like you have to understand all these base uh, network um, concepts and it can, it, it can be daunting if you look at it on the macro scale and say, how can I ever accomplish all this? Um, just start. It's such a, it's such a small thing to say. It's, it sounds almost irrelevant, but really uh, the things that get me, the thing that gets me um, through some of these harder tasks in life is just to start. So I hope that helps someone <laughs> if nothing else it's helping me it's a reinforcement of uh of what i'm trying to do here so um yeah let's modify that behavior <laughs> another big one for me you know i talked about tomorrow putting things off another uh way that I procrastinate that I think a lot of people procrastinate that's really easy to get caught in is I'll have a really difficult task like um, working towards uh, say a CCNA uh, certification right and it's all this really dense material and it's gonna be hard and then I have this other task that's uh, maybe not glamorous something that I wanted it's not something that I want to do but it's not as hard as the certification process so it's like scrubbing my bathroom or you know cleaning out the trash or something like that doing all my all my chores around the house i'll find myself um doing these lesser evil tasks the like the weeks be prior to me starting the certification process um certification process the weeks prior to that my apartment was never so clean right because <laughs> I was constantly saying, well, you know, I'm going to do that tomorrow, but what I will do today is I'll scrub my floors, I'll clean the stains out of the carpet, you know, I'll give my dog a bath, I'll, I do these other things to make myself feel okay about the choices I'm making, when in reality, I just need to start the certificate, right? Like, all this other stuff is stuff that I do anyways that isn't... It's just an excuse not to do what I should be doing. So it's just, again, like it's so easy for for us to talk our way out of things. Like, at least for me, it's so easy for myself. I should talk about myself. It's so easy for me to nibble away at my motivation. Um, you know, you'll be like, don't be afraid to sit down and go through these courses and you may be like, man, oh no, I'm daydreaming. I don't remember the last 10 minutes of this video. Like, that's going to happen. This is dense stuff. Just start the video over again. Don't don't get down about it. Don't. I, I just You just got to stick with it. You got to stick with it. Like, that's just what it comes down to. And I'm talking to myself right now, right? Like, just be motivated. Get through it. You know, these eureka moments are what's going to be the motivation. <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Let's do a little review, shall we? So let's just cover what we've already covered. This should all become easier as we go on. Uh, again, I'm talking to myself, but third person to make it not seem so crazy. So OS, OSI, we have our mnemonic. It's uh, please do not throw a sausage pizza away. <laughs> Nike, just do it. That's right. What's the name of that guy uh, that did the crazy commercial? Uh, Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf. It wasn't even it wasn't even commercial, but it got leaked. He had that green screen behind him, and he had his little mullet, and he was just like, "Just do it, just do it." <laughs> and as crazy as that is, that's a motivated person, right? Like he gets stuff done. He's a director. Act like I don't know. I don't want to get into all that, but like, you can, you can trick yourself into being like super psyched about stuff that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, so please do not throw sausage pizza away. Uh, 
this is gonna be uh, a mnemonic. So we're gonna take the first letter of each one. Uh, physical is gonna be please. Do is data link. Not is network. Throw is transport. Sausage is session. Uh, pizza is presentation. Sometimes I forget that one for some reason. Uh, and away is application. So this is our mnemonic turned into the OSI layer. Um, and we know already that physical, uh, any data that's encapsulated passing through the physical layer is going to be referred to as bits. So this is our bits. This is also going to be transported on copper wire, which is going to be like Ethernet. Uh, it's going to be transported on coaxial cable. Um, coaxial cable. Looks like I spelled it right, which is going to be like your residential modems. The last step between the street and your modem is very often uh, coaxial cable. Um, we're going to have fiber, which comes in two variants, your single mode and your multi-mode. And luckily, that's one of the things that means exactly what it sounds like. Your single mode fiber is literally just a single fiber line. So it's got one light in it going straight down the middle. Um, your single mode is typically much more expensive because that light is so powerful because it's a laser. So lasers cost money, it turns out. Um, not cheap to, uh, to be a mad scientist these days, I guess. Uh, your multi-mode is going to be just like it sounds like. Uh, it actually, it's really cool because they, uh, instead of having the light go straight down the middle of the cable, they bounce it off the sides, and that allows them to have multiple channels inside of one cable. So instead of having one pathway, you can have like four, six, eight different light paths just bouncing around inside this cable, uh, which obviously allows you to have uh, much more information traveling along those lines because you have so many more lights. It's like uh, it's like a highway. So a single mode uh, fiber is like one lane. You got that one lane. You can still go pretty fast, but if there's a collision or something, it's it's gonna bottle everything up. Multi mode, you got multiple lanes. You got multiple lanes. If there's a collision on one of them, you got all these other lanes to keep traveling down. Um, that being said, multi mode. Uh, uses a much less powerful uh, light source. They often use LEDs. Um, and for that reason, because they're less powerful, the light cannot travel as far. So multi-mode is going to be used for short distances, but it is going to be cheaper. So often multi-mode is going to be used between switches. So uh, we know that switches are layer two. So that means it's going to be inner network. They're using them inside of a network, talking within that network. Um, Whereas your single mode would be maybe it's it, because of the long distance, you might use it as like a uh, direct access point between two um, two buildings that are like within the same uh, company, but physically. Uh, separated by some amount of distance, you might use a single mode fiber between the two of them. That way you don't have to worry about anyone else getting into your data. You have direct connections, so you're still on the same network, or maybe you have different subnets. Uh, you can use routers that way, but you could even use a, a switch if you wanted to with that. Um, so let's see, that was physical. Data link is layer two. And we talk about data link as Frames. Let me check that because I want to make sure that's right. Frames, right? I have it in my notes somewhere. Man, where did I write that? <laughs> We're going to say yes. We're just going to say yes. I can Google it. Layer two frames? Question mark. Uh, Ethernet frame, frame data link, data link layer. Second layer, yeah, delivery of frames. OK, cool. So we were right. Well, it's good to check. Got to love Google. Uh, so data link uh, is layer two, also known as layer two. Um, and we're going to be using frames on layer two. So anytime you're talking about um, any kind of issue you're experiencing, 
uh, with data being encapsulated on layer two, you're going to be calling it frames. Um, what other good information is there layer two? Layer two is going to be switches, like we said. Layer two, so switches uh, work on MAC addresses. That's that's how we know they're inside of a network. Because when you're communicating on layer two, you are basing your traffic on the MAC addresses you have access to, right? So if you're transferring data from one computer to another computer, when it's at layer two, it's talking about their MAC address. So it's gonna take the MAC address of your network access card, and it's gonna say, this is your source MAC, and it's gonna take the destination MAC of where it's going, and it's gonna say, that's how it's transferring the data on layer two. Um, so this works at MAC address le level. And this is important to remember when we are talking about um, networking inside and outside of networks, like when you're working within a switch and when you have to get to a router. Um, it's important to keep in mind. Uh, let's see here. Layer operates on Mac inside their own network. Right, 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 right. Uh, so network is going to be uh, packets. It's going to be layer three. And it's going to be routers are the uh, device we're going to be using on layer three. So layer three is going to be your IP. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm not too sure what to say about that. More transport. Man, it's been a, it's been a long day. <laughs> transport is uh oh what are the segments called are they called segments oh god dang it i cannot remember mm -hmm. i want to say segments that's where i wrote this down somewhere but i can't mm. yeah layer four is segments okay gotta go with the gut on this stuff, I guess. Uh, so layer four, and this is where we're going to be deciding whether we're using TCP or UDP protocol. Um, again, so within that, TCP is your connection oriented. Uh, communication, that means there's going to be a three-way handshake. Uh, and that three-way handshake um, is synchronization, synchronized, uh, and then so you're gonna you're gonna send out some information on TCP, and uh, we're not gonna go through the whole ARP and everything, but the uh, the receiver, the host, is gonna say, okay, yeah, um, they're gonna get your first packet, which is the synchronization, and you're gonna be sending them, I wanna talk to you on TCP at port such and such. Does that sound good to you? Do you wanna, is it okay if we meet there? And the host is gonna send back an acknowledgement, a synchronization acknowledgement. Oh man, it'd help if I could spell. <laughs> uh, um, and so they're they're saying, yeah, yeah, I I agree to that. I will also use TCP. I will also meet you on this port. Let's do it. Um, and so they send that back, and then um, the initial user, so it'd be you in this instance, is going to send back an acknowledgement saying, okay, cool. Uh, so again, first you're going to be sending, hey, meet me here on TCP. They're going to send back, okay, sounds good. I'm going to meet you here on C TCP. And then you, your last leg of that, the third part of the handshake is you sending back, all right, cool. So <laughs> it's you asking, is this okay? Them saying, yeah, this is okay. And then you sending them back, great. Uh, so that's your three-way handshake. That's your connection oriented. Uh, the reason this is great is because TCP allows for flow control and um, uh, corrections. There's a better way to say that, but all I can think of is the word correction. Um, so flow control is making sure that both the initial um, 
the person sending out the initial request and the host on the other end uh, that they're talking in a manner that both of that the data between them is um, at a rate that neither one of them is dropping information right that they both can talk at that rate they both can read and write at that rate uh, you're not having any issues so that's what flow control is and make sure that everyone's communicating uh, it's kind of like a speed limit right if we go back to the an analogy of, of roads um, flow control is the speed limit on the road and it's adjusted based on best fit for both right so it's not always gonna be one thing. Um, it's gonna be based on both uh, parties in that communication. And it may change as the communication goes on, right? It's not gonna be a consistent number. You see that often when you're downloading items. Um, that number is gonna fluctuate as your bandwidth allocation fluctuates, what you're able to fit through the pipe. Um, so flow of control, Super awesome, super important for certain types of uh, communication. And then corrections are a checksum on the file. So um, it's gonna, you're gonna send in information, you're gonna get information back, and you're gonna wanna make sure that during that process of transmitting between the, the host and the, and the user, that the information wasn't corrupted for whatever reason. And there's a lot of reasons that data can get corrupted. Um, it's not, difficult for it to happen right so these checksums are super important and all they're doing is they're making sure that the data hasn't been been manipulated in the transfer process and what it does is if the data comes in and it's been manipulated it doesn't uh, match the checksum then it just throws it out and says hey i need you to rebroadcast that segment back to us um because it, it wasn't correct, it was, it was corrupted. So again, super important, especially if you wanna make sure that the files you're getting are um, complete, <laughs> that they are in their complete form, that nothing's been corrupted along the way. Um, and then the other form of traffic on transport is gonna be your UDP, and your UDP is best as. So, there is no flow control on UDP. There is very little uh, ability for correction. Um, often the only correction that UDP makes is they make that check to see if the checksum is different, but it's not asking for a rebroadcast. It's just tossing out the trash because uh, it doesn't want to pass up the layers. It doesn't want to pass on to layer five, six, and seven information that it knows is corrupted, that it knows is dead, right? So if it's a, if it's a corrupted pack, uh, sorry, segment, because we're on layer four, if it's a corrupted segment, it's just gonna, more often than not, it's just gonna drop it unless the program itself uh, specifically asks for that data and has the ability to either fix it itself internally or uh, sometimes the programs will ask for retransmissions depending on what the information is. Um, so like uh, first person shooting games, like the, the, the peakers advantage, uh, legs, stuff like that, a lot of times that has to do um, with ping, packet loss, and the fact that this information is being transmitted on uh, UDP and not TCP. Uh, so you'll have that like, um, you can tell what's TCP and UDP because sometimes you'll have that like, uh, that rubber band effect where you think you're somewhere on the map, the server thinks you're somewhere else, and the other person thinks you're even somewhere else. And as that information kind of coincides and melds into a, a coherent picture, it will cause you or the other player to kind of rubber band around a little bit. Uh, and that's all that information um, finally coming together. So that's, that's problems with flow control, that's problems with um, uh, corrupted data that's causing that, right? Flow control can be thought of as ping in this manner, and corrupted data can be thought of as dropped packets. Uh, so for the gamers out there, think of it that way. Um, let's see here, so that's layer one, two, three, four, uh, <laughs> layer five, six, and seven. I really don't know that much about them, right? So uh, layer five is your session layer, layer six, is your presentation layer uh, and layer seven is your application layer um, in all honesty 
from from what I understand is what again I don't work in the actual network field. I'm hoping to work in the network field, but from what I've heard from people that do work in the network field, uh, when it comes to levels five, six, and seven, it's basically magic, right? Like. It works or it doesn't. It's it's all magic to them. And likewise, people who um, write and create programs that work on layers five, six, and seven, uh, when it comes to layers four, three, two, and one, they're like, yeah, that that part's magic to us. So there's that kind of like segmentation of uh, of technical ability in this field. <laughs> Just people like kind of uh, trusting in the maths. <laughs> um, Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so real quickly, also, um, we talked about uh, layer one also has, uh, we talked about layer two being switches, layer three being routers. Layer one is hubs. Uh, hubs aren't used anymore for the most part, though, just because the technology behind switches has become so much less expensive. It's just much more um, economic to have switches instead of hubs. And that's because hubs work on layer one, they work on the physical layer, so they lack even the most basic uh, controls of that information. They work on broadcast, uh, they work on half duplex. So when information is sent into a hub, it is simultaneously sent out all the other ports no matter what it is. So hubs do not have the ability, because again, layer two is MAC addresses, layer three is IP. So hubs don't have the ability to know who they're talking to. They just don't have any of that upper level um, control over the data. They're literally, you can think of a hub as like a drunk guy screaming in a bar, because like, any information you put in, they're just, ah! screaming out all the other ports regardless of what it is where it's supposed to go um, that's why hubs aren't used uh, also they're half duplex so that means they can either send or receive uh, they cannot do both at the same time whereas switches routers everything above a hub everything working above layer one has that ability it's full duplex so it can send and receive at the same time uh, again if we're thinking about roads that's turning the single lane road into a dual lane road you know so again it's just so helpful for networking so uh, you're not going to see many hubs uh, i can think back to a time when they were cheap and we would use them at LAN parties and knowing what I know now, it was a horrible choice. <laughs> it was a horrible choice, <laughs> but it was cheap back then. So what can you do? Um, this is before the technology changed. I think back then switches were uh, in the hundreds of dollars just for a personal switch. Like it was crazy. Um, okay, so a little bit more review real quick. Uh, IP classes. Uh, we have two different types of classes. We have the class full, uh, which is going to be your class A, class B, and class C. Uh, class A is going to fall between 1.0.0.0.0 through 126.255.255.255. Uh, this is going to be known as a slash 8. Slash 8 is your CIDR notation. Um, it's a default mask for anything that falls within this range. If it's a class A address, it is automatically going to have the default subnet mask of slash A, and that's going to take up the first eight octets, or I'm sorry, the first octet, which is eight numbers. Woo, there's not eight octets. Um, it's going to take up the first eight numbers in that address space. Uh, making it uh, so if we wanted a dotted decimal representation of a slash 8 it would be 255.0.0.0 again that first 8 octet is all going to be turned to the one position since they're all on that's going to represent 255 and the rest are all going to be in the off position which will be 0 0 and 0 um, class B is going to be 120, oh, 128 dot zero dot zero dot zero through one ninety one dot two five five dot two five five dot two five five these are going to be a slash sixteen so we're going to be doubling it from class a to class b the mask is going to go from eight to sixteen so that's going to take up the second octet um, so it's going to be uh, dotted decimal representation would be two five five dot two five five 
dot zero dot zero. These are the exact same thing. A slash eight or a slash eight is the same thing as the dotted decimal form here. A slash sixteen is the same as the dotted decimal here. These are just two different ways of showing the same information. This is known as your CIDR, and this is known as a dotted decimal. Um, moving on, class C is going to be one nine two dot zero dot zero dot zero through two two three dot two five five dot two five five dot two five five. Um, it's going to be a slash 24. Uh, so we know that this is going to be read as presented as a dotted decimal 255.255.255.0. And again, that's because this time the first three octets, three, eight, three times eight is going to be 24, so three octets, uh, are going to be switched to the on position. The remaining octet is switched to the off position. So that's how we get those numbers. Um, Again, class A, B, and C are known as the class full uh, IP addresses. This is because they come with default mass or default subnets, which is again represented by these ping. What are you doing? Good girl. Uh, represented represented by these slash notation or the dotted decimal notation. They're both the same thing, irregardless. Um, so if those are our class full. What are our class lists? Um, IP addresses. Well, those are going to be class D and class E. Class D falls um, 224.0.0.0 through 239. Is it 239? 239, yeah. 239.255.255.255. Uh, there is no subnet mask that comes with class D, so there's not going to be any CIDR notation afterward. Uh, we can just remember that these are going to be multicast. Um, so anything that goes through that IP address is going to be multicasted out. Um, that leaves class E, which is going to start at 24.0.0.0. And it's going to run all the way to the end, which is 255.255.255.255. Um, and again, there is no um, default mask. It comes with class E, but this is what's known as the ping, need it. Experimental range of IP addresses. Sorry, my dog's chewing on her paws and she knows she shouldn't be. Don't make me come down there. All right. Uh, so that's our class full, class list IPs. You will notice that there are some missing addresses within there. That's going to be your. Um, this network uh, in the beginning, and then of course the 127.0.0.0 through 127.255.255.255, which is the loop back address, which is very important for troubleshooting. Loop back address is what you use to see if the system is capable of using uh, the TCP UDP protocols. If uh, TCP UDP protocols are down on that system, your loopback address will not work. Um, so this is kind of like the fundamental of troubleshooting uh, the network from a device outward. So this would be your first step if you're unsure if the device itself is capable of uh, connecting to the network. Um, so next we have the RFC 1918. Uh, no one ever refers to them as that. They will call them private addresses. I mean, maybe some people refer to them as the RFC 1918. I've never heard them referred to that way, but I don't work <laughs> in the, in the uh, field yet, so that's probably why, to be honest. Um, these are a little bit harder to remember. They don't follow the same um, kind of general, easy to manipulate uh, math that the other ones do. They kind of, they seem to almost be a little bit more peculiar. And that's, so what I mean by that is like the other ones, you can see a clear pattern, right? It's the front, the front octet is the most important and it's followed by all zeros. 
Uh, again, the front octet is the most important, and then it's followed by all two five fives, right? And that's how the class A, B, Cs, that's how the class Ds and Es are separated. But then you get down to these private addresses, and the first one, the class A follows that rule, right? It's 10.0.0.0. And then it goes 10.255.255.255. That, that makes sense, right? It follows the same one. Then class B, it goes 175.16.0.0 to 176.31.255. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 176. Uh, 31.255.255, right? This is, you can kind of follow along, right? Because it's class B, so the subnet would be on the second octet so the first number is the same the second number changes a little bit and then the third and fourth octet follow the same pattern but then you get to uh i don't know what i just moved i moved something i screwed that up um you get to class c and and you would think if it's following the same pattern as class b then it would manipulate all the way out to the third octet but no it still only manipulates the second octet. So I just get really confused with the private addresses. That's one that you just got to, at least for me, is just pure memorization. There is no, uh, there is no pattern to follow like the other ones. Uh, so it makes it a little bit harder. Just got to put it on a flashcard and remember it. <laughs> um, so let's talk about subnets really quick. Uh, we have our class full subnets, which are default, which I like to, I just think of as the default, um, default subnet that comes with that. So if you class A, if you see an address in that, uh, in that range, you know it's gonna default to a slash eight. If you see a class B, it's gonna default to a slash 16. If you see a class C, you know it's going to default to a slash 24. Why is that important? Well, that's because uh, it's part of how we figure out um, how many networks a subnet mask will do. So if we think of the octets, the dotted decimal or the octets, if we think of them as the portion under the mask, so whatever falls under the mask, so if we're talking about a class B, it's the first two octets if we think of the portion that falls under the mask as the network portion and the portion that falls outside the network as the host portion so everything that's under the the mask is your network everything that's outside of it are uh, ips that can be um, assigned to various devices so we have our default masks that come with the ips and then we have our uh or we have our default subnets and then we have the masks that we can put over those defaults so anytime we add a mask it's a classless um it's going to fall within the classless um brackets it's, it's cider notation uh dotted decimal mask so it's going to be like a slash 25 um, up to a slash 30, something like that. And what that means is we're borrowing bits from the network side because we're adding onto the mask and we're taking away bits from the host side. So the, the, the formulas that we need to remember for that is uh, your network is going to be 2 to the power of x um, and x is going to be... Um, the bits borrowed uh, to the network. So for instance, on a slash uh, 26, uh, on a 192 um, address, so we look at the IP, we see it's 192, so we know this is a default we know this is a class C IP, so it's going to default to a slash 24, um, but we're making it a slash 26, so that means we're going to borrow two bits. So X in this case is going to equal two, so it's going to be two uh, to the power of two. So we're going to have four networks um, with this borrow. But because we're adding networks, that means we're taking away hosts. So um, 
hosts are going to be two. The formula for the host is going to be two to the power of y, where y is the host portion. Um, so what we can do for this math is if we think about um, all of the octets put together, four octets, so four times eight, there's 32 possibilities, minus our new subnet mask, which is 26, is going to leave us with six left over. So that's going to be our new host portion. So then we're going to take two to the power of six, which is a number. <laughs> Let's look at our sheet. Uh, two to the power of six is 64. <laughs> it shouldn't have been as hard as it was. Um, so then we know we have uh, 64 assignable IPs, uh, or no, 64 IPs per a network. However, the uh, continuation of this formula is minus two. Um, and the reason for that is because in each one of these networks, in each one of these subnets, uh, the first IP address and the last IP address are reserved for your network and your broadcast. Um, so the assignable IPs is only 62 out of the 64 addresses. Uh, super important to remember, there's always going to be, not always, but typically on the certification uh, process on those tests, they're going to throw out um, uh, a network that would fit if not for the broadcast and network addresses. So you got to remember that minus two, uh, or it will cause you to <laughs> miss a question and later on in your career uh, misappropriate a subnet, which would probably be a pain in the butt too. Um, correct. <sighs> so um, powers of two are something you're going to be running across uh, a lot. My mind's a little um, foggy right now, but it is one of the things that I've been practicing. I recommend yet another flashcard for your powers of two. Um, making it all the way uh, up through uh, to the power of 10 is a good place to be um, because once you know to the power of 10 you can, it, it's a little it's, it's fairly easy to double that up to uh, all the way up to the to the power of 14 or so that's when it really starts getting exponential um, but you will need to know this stuff because if you have like a class um, class A that's being subnet masked all the way out to a class C or something like that, uh, you are going to have some rather large two to the powers there um, that you're going to have to work with. And, and, and it's something that you might come across on these uh, certificate process. They love to make you uh, make a bunch of different uh, variable link subnets. So that's something I'm still practicing. It's still something I'm very much not comfortable with. Um, but I'm just going to continue to go through those problems uh, and become comfortable with creating multiple subs. Uh, sub and it's it's not so much the, the 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 basic formulas and the process of creating subnets is not so much confusing for me. It's um, sometimes it's more so manipulating the IP that's given to you to begin with uh, can be fairly confusing for me. Uh, where the where the manipulation fits and that kind of comes back to these private addresses sometimes I get confused because in my mind because this is defaults to a slash 16 all the manipulation should be happening at that octet um, and so this is this is a mental block for me this is something I have to work through myself um, it's going to be one of those eureka moments I'm happy because uh, when I do get through that it's going to be just that extra motivation because I know I'm capable of it, you know? It's gonna be something I can I can use to get over the, the next hump after that. So just keep plugging away, keep your nose to the grindstone. Uh, and when you do uh, make a breakthrough, when you do have those eureka moments, just take a minute to be like, this is all possible because I took the time to start, right? If I hadn't, if I hadn't have started, I never would have gotten to this point where I achieved um, this knowledge base. So, as silly as it sounds, um, sometimes that's that's all it takes is just forcing yourself to start. All right, 
So this has all been review up to this point. Um, some new information, uh, more flashcards. This is this is all going to be flashcards right here. Uh, common ports. There are some ports that you are going to be using that network individuals use very commonly. Um, and this is something that you just have to, at least for the test, you have to, to um, memorize. I mean, we all understand that out in the real world, you're gonna have your phone on you. Uh, you're gonna have uh, people you work with that are gonna be able to help you, to remind you uh, of what is what, but ultimately, you need to know this for the test. And depending on where you're working, you're gonna be working with these um, these protocols so commonly that it's just, it, it's just better, just, you know, just learn it. You know you need to, you need to do it for the test, so just commit it to memory. Uh, I have learned most of these prior. I learned these for the um, networking uh, test I took for CompTIA. Uh, unfortunately, I have not used them since that test. So <laughs> it's all familiar, but it's all also foggy. Um, so I'm putting them on the flashcards, and there we go. Uh, so let's uh, file uh, FTP, file transfer protocol. Uh, this is going to be found TCP 2021. It's using TCP because we need the ability for those checksums. We need to know that this data hasn't been corrupted, right? These are files that we need to know. Um, are intact. So you might use this for a number of reasons as uh, when you're on the network, but certainly when you're like saving uh, the configuration files uh, for for your devices, um, you don't want to save them just to the device because uh, if the device goes out, then you need to um, come up with a whole new configuration file, right? However, if you were to save that file, say directly to an FTP server, on your network, then if the router went out, uh, you could replace the device, or if the router, for whatever reason, the non-volatile memory and the volatile memory was um, erased, you would have access to these files through the file transfer protocol on your on your um, file server. So this is gonna be something we're gonna be using, not just for that, but that's, that's just an example of why you'd wanna use it. Um, so it's, again, this is gonna be on the TCP and it's gonna be using ports 20 and 21. Uh, port 21 is your control port, so that's where the three-way handshake's gonna happen. That's where all the um, big brain stuff is gonna happen as far as making the choices for the connection. Uh, whereas port 20 is where all the data transfer is actually gonna happen. So the, um, the real difficult choices are made on port 21. You can think of that as like the, the administrative port. Port 20 is like the labor port. It's where all the uh, the actual information is going to be transferred, the, the bulk of your, your file. Uh, TFTP is your trivial file transfer protocol. So you're just adding a T on the front of there. And it's trivial because it uses UDP. So it's not going to have a three-way handshake. There is no control port for this one. Um, it's being delivered best as. And so the only time you want to use TFTP is when the application you're using has the ability to do error control. Um, some applications have full flow control built in um, and it has the ability to get packets resent. Otherwise, you might end up with some... Um, shoddy files that just don't, they're, they're gonna be corrupt. So you need that ability if you're gonna be using TFTP because it is broadcasting on UDP and you don't have the ability on UDP uh, to resend corrupted files. So that's just something to keep in mind, especially for, for when we're taking these certificate tests because that's the kind of stuff they love to, uh, to check you on to see if you realize which one's gonna be performing on UDP versus TCP, uh, another clear, uh, choice they like to, to make between the two is which one's going to be um, broadcasting securely and which one's going to be uh, broadcasting in the clear. 
they're going to love those questions as well. Um, we'll cover that a little bit further on with some of these protocols. So DNS, this is going to be another one that we're going to be using a lot uh, as network. Uh, any, anywhere you're working on the network, you're going to need to know DNS. That's the do domain name system. Uh, this works on both TCP and UDP port 53. Uh, the vast majority of the information is going to be on TCP, uh, but it can also flow on UDP. I think this has more to do with um, just making sure it's accessible more so than any kind of uh, worry about the information itself uh, being corrupted or having flow control problems because this domain name server, the information being broadcast is very tiny. Essentially, all this is doing is, um, uh, so when we type in like google.com, uh, google.com is not an actual server. The server is an IP address. It's a dotted decimal address with a port. Um, we just call it Google because it's easier to remember, right? But when you type in Google, you're actually going to an IP. And what happens is you need a domain name server. So you say, I want to go to Google. Uh, your, whatever you're typing that into, your browser sends that to the nearest DNS server and it says, hey, this guy wants to go to Google. What's an IP address for Google? And the DNS sends back an IP address and it goes, cool, and it takes you to that site. <laughs> but you don't see any of that, right? All you see is Google, boom, it, it pops up. But really what's happening is you're communicating with a DNS server. The DNS server is populating that name to an IP address. Um, and there can be... Uh, so when you're working in networking, you can create your own DNS servers. So if you have internal servers, if you have internal mail servers, internal file transfer protocol, or I'm sorry, internal file servers, um, internal telecommunication, all that kind of stuff, anything that you're going to be communicating with, any other routers that you want to communicate with inside of your network um, can be maintained uh, via a private DNS. Um, and there's tons of DNS, there's tons of domain name servers all over the internet. Um, a lot of them aren't standalone servers. They can be built into routers. Uh, you can turn your private router into a DNS. So, uh, DNS doesn't take up a lot of space in and by itself, it, especially if you're like a very small network and you're not going to be, uh, referring to it a lot, asking it to give you information. Um, it can be, very uh, very small footprint, just kind of depending. Um, so next we're gonna be talking about Secure Shell. Uh, so this is the first time, actually we're gonna talk about Secure Shell and Telnet at the same time. Um, so uh, SS SSH is Secure Shell, Telnet as Telnet. For some reason there is no uh, acronym for Telnet. It is just Telnet, <laughs> which is, you, you wonder why more of these things couldn't just be what they are. Uh, but we love our acronyms. So SSH and Telnet are two different ways of communicating through uh, a program like Putty uh, to a device like a router or uh, a switch um, to make changes to that device. The difference being um, secure sh well first of all which ports they broadcast on clearly is a difference uh, secure shell uses tcp port 22 whereas telnet uses tcp port 23 however secure shell uh, it broadcasts all its information encrypted so uh, anything that is broadcasting over the line has some kind of encryption um, and that encryption is, is based on what you choose uh, typically, whereas Telnet broadcasts everything in the clear. There is no encryption. So uh, if for whatever reason, anywhere along that pathway between you and the device you're talking to, if someone is sniffing packets, uh, which means they're taking packets off the network, uh, and opening them up to see what's inside, if anyone's sniffing packets anywhere along that uh, pathway and you're broadcasting in secure shell, you're fine. It's encrypted. They're not going to be able to open that data up and see what you're saying to the network or to that device. Um, however, if you're broadcasting in Telnet and they grab that data, everything they grab 
is, is clear text. Nothing's encrypted. So what you type in is what's being sent is what they're able to see. So with a lot of these devices, one of the first things you're going to do is uh, you're going to type in enable, which if anyone happens to remember, enable is going to bring us up to the next layer on a device. So for a Cisco device, it's going to take us from like kind of the plug layer to the executive um, the privileged executive layer, which is the next layer. Uh, but usually when you get into the privileged executive layer, there's a password login you have to use uh, because you're getting to that heightened state. So if you're logging into that device over Telnet, people will be able to see literally uh, your user login and your password. And then they'll be able to see also the destination IP and all that other information. So they can just log in right after you <laughs> into that device and make whatever choices they want to make, whatever changes they want to make, they can burrow further into the system. Uh, so just don't use Telnet. Like, I don't even know why it's an option anymore. I just don't use Telnet. You all, I've never known, again, I'm a newbie. I haven't really worked in a lot of these situations, but I've never known a situation where you could only use Telnet and not SSH. Um, as they both work through putty. So as long as that port's open, there's no reason for you not to use SSH over Telnet. Or, or there's no reason to use Telnet over SSH. You, you always want to use encryption when you have the choice. You always want to use... So encryption is super important, and TCP is super important when you want the information to, to be verified, right? So let's just keep that in mind. Um, Let's see here, some other ones. SMT, SMTP, this is your simple mail transfer protocol. And this is gonna be on TCP 25, right? Um, the simple mail transfer protocol, I can't remember exactly, uh, is responsible for two things within the mail system, I'm pretty sure. It's responsible for users it updates when users send information out, and it does another thing for the host system, I believe. There's actually a couple of different mail transfer protocols, so I don't remember them verbatim right now what they do, but that is, so that's something, make a note of it for myself real quick. That I wanna make sure I look into that further and I can um, talk about which one does which. Uh, the next one is DHCP. This is your dynamic host configuration protocol. Uh, this is another one we're going to be using pretty commonly in the networking degree path. This is going to be, notice, a UDP, not a TCP. And it works on two different ports. It works 67 and 68. Uh, typically, when a protocol works on two different ports, it's because one of those ports is um, reserved for kind of like your control and the other one's um, more for your like data flow. So I'm, again, I'm not completely sure on this one though. So that's gonna be something I'm gonna wanna look into and recognize for myself. Uh, next we got HTTP. This should be pretty, um, common knowledge for most people. HTTP is your hypertext transfer protocol. That's websites. Uh, and that's on TCP port 80. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the other option, of course, is HTTPS. I think I said too many T's there. HTTPS, um, which is your hypertext transfer over SSL TLS. Um, and SSL TLS is just different protocols for encryption. Uh, just think of that as uh, ways to encrypt. Uh, and that's gonna go over TCP uh, 443. So HTTP and HTTPS is, uh, you know, accessing, they're both accessing web servers. The difference is one of, it, it, one of them is doing it in encrypted fashion and the other one is doing it in a clear text fashion. So again, uh, keep that in mind uh, for websites that you use that have a username password. Um, a lot of them, even if the website itself is an HTTP, when you hit the login button, if you pay real close attention, it's going to send you to an HTTPS 
uh, web page. And that's because anyone that knows anything does not want you to send your login and password over clear text. Um, you always want to use a secure protocol uh, for those aspects. Um, to make it as hard as possible for people to rip your stuff off. Um, pop 3, uh, sorry, pop version 3, uh, there is all the way up to version 3. I remember learning these um, for the networking. However, version 3 is the most recent and the most commonly used. It's your post office protocol. It's going to be TCP 110. Um, pop version 3. Um, Pop version 3 TCP. Uh, NTP is kind of easy because it sounds like the port it's on. NTP is on port uh, 123. NTP 123. UDP. I don't know. Maybe it's just the frequency at which you say it. <laughs> but NTP is your network time protocol. This is how clocks update. This is how clocks. Um, so when you down in <laughs> your um, uh, when you're changing your time zone and stuff, uh, NTP is the the protocol that's updating that. That's making sure that you are in sync with all the other systems out there. So like Greenwich Mean Time and stuff like that. This uh, NTP is the protocol version of the Greenwich Mean Time clock. <laughs> for anyone that understands what I just said, super nerdy. Um, NetBIOS. Uh, NetBIOS is NetBIOS. It's not an acronym. It just is what it is. Um, it's not a protocol that's commonly used, but it is something within the networking uh, field that we're gonna that we're gonna be uh, working with. As it sounds, NetBIOS. Uh, it's the BIOS for the network, I believe. So it's definitely something that we're going to want to be familiar with. Uh, saying that, I don't know anything about it. So this is something I'm going to need to uh, grow my knowledge base on. Uh, but what I can learn really quickly without having to know too much about it is what protocols it uses and what ports it uses, right? Uh, so NetBIOS uses both TCP and UDP, and it uses three different ports, 137, 138, and 139. Luckily, they're all uh, right on top of each other, so there's no like crazy uh, memorizing three different numbers. They're, they're all right in the line, so that's nice. Uh, IMAP. Uh, is your internet message access protocol super super important as well something that uh, you're gonna be uh, making sure that this port is open uh, when people are having problem with net traffic and, and such this is gonna be one of those ports that you're gonna want to check um, SNMP man that almost looks like simp <laughs> <laughs> this is your simple network <laughs> management protocol. Uh, simple network management protocol. Is that emails? That sounds right. It's been a while, man. I need to relearn all this stuff so badly. Uh, TCP, UDP, 161, IMAP is email. Oh, my bad. IMAP is email. Yeah, that, that makes more sense because simple network management protocol I thought was uh, like assigning. Man, I used to know this stuff like the back of my hand and now I'm just spacing. Uh, border gateway protocol I think has something to do with like uh, your network gateway if I'm not mistaken, but man. It's only going to get better from here, boys. I'm only going to know more. <laughs> uh, your border uh, gateway protocol is going to be on TCP 179. Uh, then we have LDAP, which is your lightweight directory access protocol. Uh, it's going to work on TCP and UDP 389. Uh, there's also the light uh, access uh protocol same thing only it sorry lightweight directory access protocol 
only it has an S on the end. When it has an S on the end, you know that means it has encryption included. So just like HTTP switches to HTTPS, and you know that includes encryption, uh, same thing with the lightweight directory access protocol S. Uh, it just means you're adding, uh, it's going to be over TLS or SSL. Uh, and TLS and SSL are just um, encrypted uh, protocols. I don't know if that's the right word. Maybe. And out of the two, typically you want to choose SSL over TLS if that's an option, uh, if I remember correctly from my security certificate. Um, lastly, eh, for emails on people's phones. SMTP POP3, POP version 3, and IMAP had to be used to configure stuff a while ago for emails on other people's phones. That, that all makes sense to me. I remember learning a bunch of these had to do with emails, and it has to do with different aspects of the email. So we, I mean, I, when I say I, or when I say we, I'm always talking about myself because it's just me. Uh, <laughs> so often when I think of email, I think it should all be done on one protocol. But actually uh, updating, like when you get notifications that you have an uh, email waiting for you, I think that's part of POP3, if I'm not mistaken. Like that's its own part of the protocol. And then simple mail transfer protocol, I think has to do with you receiving the email update, like from the server. So how when you open an email, and then you log in somewhere else on your account and it shows that email has already been open. Like there's, it has to like update on the network and stuff. Like there's so many different protocols that email uses. Yeah, pop, so POP3 is receiving only. Yeah, man, that's, whew, I remember that being so hard to remember the different aspects of how those interacted with email. But yeah, I mean, it's the internet, right? Email, I mean, it doesn't take up a lot of the internet, but it is a, prominent part of the internet, right? So we're not talking about volume because emails are very small in size, but if we're talking about um, like, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, how common they are. They're very common. <laughs> so there's a lot of different protocols that have to do with email uh, and keeping it all straight and updated. So it's just, again, that's that's going to be um, a flashcard. And the, so I should talk about how I do flashcards. So my flashcards, um, it, it's not just flashcards. Like I'm, you'll see I'm typing this out. I've already typed all this stuff out. I'm typing it out again. Like it's all about repetition. So flashcards for me is just seeing something repetition over and over again. But also when I start, my flashcards are very barren. Like, luckily I already know a lot of these ports and things. I don't remember what they're used for, but I remember a lot of the ports, so it's gonna be easier for me. But when I very first started, <laughs> uh, when I very first started, all I would have on my card is on one side it would say FTP, on the other side it would say File Transfer Protocol. That's all I would have. Because if you try to add too much into those cards at one time, you it's just, it just becomes like, again, I'm talking about myself. It becomes like confetti in my brain. Like it's just too much, it's information overload, right? But what will happen is over time I'll know FTP file transfer protocol, easy, got it, bam. So what I'll do is I'll add, okay, FTP file transfer protocol works on TCP. I don't go into the port, I just put TCP. So I know file transfer protocol works on TCP. And then once I have that down, then I'll put file transfer protocol works on TCP on ports 2021. And then when I get that down, then I'll have a description of what I can expect to find when I'm using that protocol. So hopefully by the end of it, that flashcard really does encapsulate what that protocol does, but that's not how it starts, right? It starts in a very, very, very basic form. Like, um, it's almost comical how I'm in, when I do these certificates, I build up like just these little sand grains of knowledge into full field, not full fields, but like into these certificates. Like, I'm I'm still amazed that that I'm able to learn this stuff somehow. So it is just kind of this um, 
this repetition and the slowly building up of information um, over over this kind of minute um, period of time. Uh, so, uh, so th this is this is FTP over T T or TLS SSL. Uh, so I would refer to it as FTPS because it's a secure version of FTP. Um, so this is going to be more like FTP than it's going to be like F a TFTP. And the reason for that is it's going to be using TCP. So it's going to have that flow control. It's going to have the checksum for error uh, detection. The, the difference is it's going to be secure. So this FTP still has the, the initial FTP still has the error control, still has, or still has the error correction and flow control, um, but it doesn't have that encryption aspect. So again, if you have to log into your FTP, or if you have to log into your file transfer server over FTP before you can send or receive files, which again, very common, because you don't want just anyone accessing your file server. Um, if you're broadcasting that information in the clear, not over a secure encrypted channel, anyone who's sniffing those packets has access to it. So you might think that just because it's inside your network, it's safe. But I mean, you look into like the Sony hacks that happened uh, a couple years ago or something like any, any of the most recent hacks, if you really look into them, the thing that's remarkable is when hackers access a network they will take years once they get that initial access and they'll just crawl through the system gaining access to to item to device over device and it, it's a long slow process and they just hide and they hide and they wait and they just grab as much information off the network as possible waiting for someone to make the mistake of broadcasting something in the clear it, it just takes one person <laughs> and it's often you know the as good as security is on these networks, it's almost always an individual and not a system. It's almost always an individual. And it's not necessarily directly that's an individual's fault. You know, you got things like shoulder surfing, people that look over your shoulder. Uh, you have um, you have like phishing or, or uh, fake sites uh, that people link you to, like really common issues. Uh, so like people that play World of Warcraft uh, way back in the day, there was there was scams that would um, that you know people would just send out mass emails saying like your account needs to be updated, log in, uh, and people it looked really it looked like it came from Blizzard, the company, the website that popped up looked very similar to the it you know they make it to look as close to the real thing as possible, and people were giving away their login and passwords, and of course because we we are the human beings that we are so many people um because you're told not to write down your login and password will use the same login password for site after site because they don't want to write it down but they also don't want to have to remember and again when i say they i'm talking about myself <laughs> So I know I can't write down this information because that'll get me in trouble if someone finds that information just written down somewhere. But I also know that it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to remember 12, 13, 20, 30 different logins and different passwords for all those different logins. Um, so it's just more of a reason to be careful with the information you have to make sure that you're not broadcasting it over those clear channels. Um, but also don't feel bad if you're the person that brings down the network. It's, you know, we're all just humans. We're doing the best we can. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of websites that have come out recently. There's a lot of applications that have come out recently that try to, try to tackle this problem to where uh, you only need to remember the login and password to get into like a password vault website or application that then holds all the various logins and passwords for your your mini accounts so you're just remembering an overall password that gives you access to the rest of your information uh which is a great idea really neat um a lot of people in like the financial uh sector and things like that use use those um use those applications um devil's advocate advocate 
advocate. The thing that scares me about those sites is they are such a juicy tar target. Because <laughs> it's like, man, if you could worm your way into one of those password vaults, <sighs> how much access might you have? Like, how well do they uh, keep that data separate from one another? Or is it just one huge data trove? Because, man, that just seems like such a target to me. Um, but you create those sites with that in mind, right? Like, obviously, the person that created that, um, that first came up with that idea was like, well, yeah, we'd be an obvious target. So security has to be foremost in our mind. And, and of course, if, if one of those sites ever did get hacked, their accountability would, you know, they, they, you couldn't, you can't expect a return customer after something like that, um, depending on the data breach, the level of the da data breach. So yeah, something to keep in mind. But but also, like like I said, really cool concept. There's a there's a way that someone filled a filled a need, filled a growing need. You know, really neat, really really neat. Um, yeah. So this was kind of just again today clearly based on what I was talking about in the beginning about motivation and stuff, I had a little bit of a rough day today getting started. Um, and that's why I wanted to come on here and just re remind myself, because again, ultimately I'm just talking to myself, that really it is all about like, motivation doesn't come out of thin air. You know, I, I typically don't wake up in the morning and think to myself, I'm motivated to get something done today. More often what happens is I have to force myself to start that task and the motivation comes after I start it. The motivation is me saying, well, I'm here, I'm doing this. Why? I, there's, there's really not much of a reason to stop. Like I might want to stop because again, this material is dense. It's not entertaining. Um, but if I stop, then I'm just becoming that person that I was last week, that person that constantly said tomorrow, right? And that person was saying tomorrow for so long, I could have already achieved this certificate. I could have achieved this certificate a couple of times over maybe already. So ultimately, I just need to remind myself, I need to stay in the mindset that this is how you move forward, right? So in the mindset that this is how you move forward, and with the motivation that it only starts after you start. Like, <laughs> it takes two to tango, uh, other meaningless sayings. <laughs> um, so some other things I wanted to cover real quickly were some more resources that I've been using. Uh, so I've been using... Um, uh, Bomb Bells, another one of my courses on Udemy. He also has his own website uh, where he has a number of free quizzes, software, and videos. All his quizzes, for the most part, have to do with uh, subnetting. Here's hexadecimal. We haven't even gone into that yet. Um, here's binary to decimal. This is the most basic. This is where you should probably start doing uh, binary to decimal and decimal to binary, uh, and then move your way up to... Uh, I guess subnetting questions, subnetting questions two, and then subnetting quiz. Uh, it look, I'm guessing the subnetting quizzes are all over IP4, but if they're IP6, that's when you're going to need to get into hexadecimal. Uh, IP4 works only um, with, with dotted decimal, uh, so you're only working with numbers. Uh, hexadecimal is IP version 6, and to add all those extra network ac uh, addresses, they had to add um, extra placeholders. So instead of working, um, uh, man, I, I don't think I should jump into this like this. <laughs> so instead of being 255.255.255, it's going to be uh, an assortment of numbers and letters. So not only do you have uh, the one through nine number that you can put in each one of those uh, positions of the decimal, you also have A through H. Uh, and those are represented by 11 through 11 through 17, <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken. 
<laughs> but we'll jump into that later. I've been exclusively working on IP version 4 thus far. Uh, but IP version 6 is going to include that hexadecimal. It is something that you not only want to learn for the certificate, but if we're talking about where network is moving, some companies have made the switch to IV version 6, but there's still a lot of job opportunity out there for contracts for people that are going to be hired uh, just to go through people's networks and do those updates. Um, even with the amount of automation that you can do, uh, there still needs to be some network people looking over the shoulder of those programs and making sure that all these uh, addresses are being um, doled out in the correct manner. Also, there's there's always static IDs that you need within your network. Typically, uh, you do things like the printers on your network, uh, any kind of special server that you're using, like your DNS, you're going to want to um, give a static IP address. Uh, you're going to want to assign a static IP address to those services so that they're easier to troubleshoot, uh, they're easier to track. Uh, whereas everything else, all the users outside of those special services are going to get um, dynamic IPs. They're going to get I, uh, assigned IPs. So even with IP version 6, uh, certain aspects of those can be automated just like with IP version 4, but other aspects do need to be hand, um, uh, hand manipulated in uh, via an actual network person uh, taking into the device and changing, making those changes. Um, so that would be a global configuration within that device. So we'd, if we were logged into a Cisco device, we would enable to get up to the executive, um, privileged executive uh, mode. But to make a change, like we're talking about making a static, we'd want to go to the next uh, mode up, which would be configure terminal. Configure terminal takes us to that global mode where we could uh, assign a static ID to that device. So again, I'm just trying to include all the different aspects of what I've learned so far. Uh, there are still some holes, but again, as many connections as I can make, <laughs> the better. Uh, it grows understanding, um, it grows confidence. Here's another one. Uh, this is Professor, I, I don't think he goes by Professor. This is Dion, Dion Training. Um, he's the main person I've been using through Udemy so far. Uh, he's He's rated the highest out of all the Udemy courses. Um, he is a little tough to understand on some of these concepts. He does uh, have a rather monotone <laughs> way of speaking about these things, but that's just what you have to expect when you're dealing with technology. So uh, do what you can to hype yourself up uh, outside of these courses and then just sit down and get into it. Uh, but he also has his own website. He has a number of tutorials. He has some great information. What I was reading, the reason I was a little late today, is he just put out this article, uh, The Best IT Career Advice from 111 Industrial Gurus. So I was in the middle of reading this when I realized it was past my 4 o'clock uh, stream tar start time. So I recommend all these just perusing these people's websites because a lot of times they do have some of these more uh, more informative articles. That being said, uh, these people are trying to sell a service, so keep that in mind. <laughs> if, they, if they're constantly pushing you towards a certificate that they happen to offer training in, that might be something to keep in mind. That being said, uh, Dion seems to be very upfront with his stuff. Uh, I did end up reading through a little bit of this. I'm not entirely uh, familiar with all the concepts. It sounds like I need to uh, look into NetApp based on this. But uh, I'll include this um, link as well uh, as all the other links I always visit. Um, actually, just give me one moment. I will be right back. Popper.
little girl's causing some problems today. What's going on? What's going on? You okay? All right, so we were talking about this article. Um, <laughs> you gonna be good? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Gotta gotta watch after the dog. She's been over over uh, chewing her paws. That's been causing some problems. I'm good. Um, so I, I'll include all these links as always um, in the wrap ups on the on the YouTube channel. Um, but I thought this one was really interesting. Uh, if you don't want to read all the way through it, there's a summary at the end, uh, and they most notably talk about. Uh, coding a APIs. Um, so that's something I'm going to have to look into more. It sounds like it's something that's really expected in the field nowadays. Um, and I think those are just like batch files, uh, like like executables, but I'm not entirely sure. So hopefully I can talk some more on that tomorrow or maybe the day after as far as is how this will affect um, the industry at large. Uh, but this is always something to keep an eye on. Um, if you're going for these certificates, you also want to have a, another eye on the field itself. <laughs> Make sure that you're working towards something that makes sense. Um, yeah, so this, again, this is just another resource. He also has uh, other things up here. Uh, so he had some subnetting problems and things like that that you can use for free. Um, something else to keep in mind, like... Uh, you know, you do have to learn this stuff for the certificates. Uh, that being said, when you're at your job, you're going to have access to so much more information. You're not going to be uh, necessarily expected to uh, pull this information up out of your uh, memory on the spot. Um, you know, unless it's something that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. But if it's something that, that you uh, typically only see once a year, once every two or three years uh, with various updates, then, you know, just don't get too uh, down on yourself when it comes to learning this stuff. Um, but yeah, this was just a, a super general overview today. Again, I didn't get near as much accomplished as I wanted to. So today's wrap up is more of a... Uh, a uh, review of what we've gone off before, as well as an introduction to some common ports. Um, that's not to say that I didn't get uh, a lot viewed today. It's just I was unable to uh, bring it into these conversations in a way that didn't just make it sound like I was uh, talking about nothing. Because in, unless you can make connections further than than just what the name of something is or or beyond that, I don't I don't really know how much it's helping. Um, so yeah, we're gonna keep this up. Uh, I'm just I'm gonna keep going even over the weekends. So I will be here again tomorrow at uh, four my time. Maybe I might I might look into making that a little later in the day to maybe six. But as it stands. Looking at four, so <laughs> I will see you guys again tomorrow afternoon. I appreciate appreciate my buddy exhibitor popping in. Appreciate you. Um, and I will be back tomorrow to talk some more about this stuff. So take it easy, everyone, and stay motivated. And uh, just remember, it all starts with starting. <laughs> take it easy. <laughs>